Recently, we read a paper by Osama Shimamira in which he talked about purifying a corin from jellyfish. It turns out jellyfish glow green and they glow along the bottom edge of the bell like this. And so he biochemically purified a protein from these fluorescent regions that's called acorn. And acorn gives off blue light. But the jellyfish generally go, glows green. And he ended up purifying a second protein called green fluorescent protein. That we commonly refer to GFP for green fluorescent protein. And what happens is that the blue light from acorn stimulates green fluorescent protein, that is some of the energy from a corn given off through the blue light is taken up by GFP and then GFP gives off green light, green fluorescence, and so the jellyfish looks like it glows green. Ultimately, Shimamira won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of a corn and green fluorescent protein. But why would you win the Nobel Prize for figuring out why jellyfish glow green? Well, it turns out that Shimamira revolutionized light microscopy because now you could tag proteins with green fluorescent protein and study their distribution within cells. After Shimamira discovered the two proteins that cause jellyfish to glow green, Marty Chalfie at Columbia University discovered the gene that encodes green fluorescent protein. We all know that genes are encoded in our DNA and there are four molecules called nucleotides that make up the DNA strand. There's adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And these are typically denoted by A, T, C, and G, the first letter of their name. Mm -hmm. In DNA, these four molecules are held together through covalent bonds like beads on a string. So you could have a order of A, T, G, C, A, A, T, G, C, A, and so on. And this string goes on for a very, very long time. And it turns out that DNA doesn't have a single strand of these nucleotides, but a double strand. And the second strand, uh, every A is bound to a T, every T is bound to an A, every G is bound to a C, and every C is bound to a G. So if you know the top strand, you automatically can deduce the bottom strand because an A would be a T here, an A would be a T, a T would be an A, a G would be a C, a C would be a G, an A would be a T, and so on. So there's two strands, and it turns out that this strand is twisted a little bit, which is called the double helix. So you have the double helix, and that double helix ultimately folds up to form a chromosome. The structure of the double helix was discovered by Watson and Crick using Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography data. And ultimately, Watson and Crick, along with Maurice Wilkins, who was Rosalind Franklin's boss, won the Nobel Prize for the discovery. Rosalind Franklin certainly would have won the Nobel Prize, but she passed away prior to the award and they don't give the Nobel Prize out to people that have passed on. Ultimately, the full-length double-stranded 
ultimately the full length double helix strand folds up to form a chromosome. In humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we have two chromosomes number two of chromosome number one, two of chromosome number two, and so on. We get one copy of the chromosome from our mother and one copy of the chromosome from our father. And we have 22 pair of autosomal chromosomes and two sex chromosomes. If you receive an X chromosome from your mother and an X chromosome from your father, then you're female. If you receive an X chromosome from your mother and a Y chromosome from your father, you're male. Okay, but what is a gene? If I denote the top strand of the DNA simply as a line, I mean, there's A, T, C's, and G's here, but I'm just going to draw it as a line and leave out the names of the nucleotides. And this goes on for a very long time in both directions because chromosomes are extremely long. And we also have the bottom strand, which is called the complementary strand. And that goes on for a long time. And of course, there are A's, A up here would be a T down here and so on. But we're just gonna leave it as a line denoting the two strands of the nucleotides of a DNA molecule, of a chromosome, sorry. A gene is a region along the DNA that ultimately encodes an RNA molecule, and some of those RNA molecules are ultimately translated into proteins. So genes give rise to RNA molecules, and some of the RNA molecules give rise to proteins. So only 1 to 2 percent of all of the DNA actually encodes RNA molecules. And if this is a region that encodes an RNA, then one of these two strands gets copied into an RNA molecule, which is called transcription. The process of transcription is where an RNA molecule is encoded from a DNA strand. So it would be an exact copy of a region of the chromosome, or region of the DNA, and an exact copy of this strand would be converted into an RNA molecule. And RNAs are also made up of nucleotides, except the thymine are replaced by uracil. So it's A, U, G, and C are the molecules, are the nucleotides that make up RNA molecules. But this copy is called heteronuclear RNA, so they call it HNRNA, heteronuclear RNA, which is an exact copy of this strand, except that instead of T's, it has U's, that is, Instead of thymine, it has uracil in its place. But this is not a mature RNA molecule. This molecule then is spliced, which means part of this heteronuclear RNA molecule is removed. And so you might, this piece could be an exon, exon, E-X-O-N, and then there's an intervening sequence called an intron, which gets spliced out, and then a second exon, and another intron, perhaps, and another exon, and so on. And there can be many exons and introns, but ultimately the introns are removed, and the exons are joined together to form a smaller molecule. So this, this part here could be exon one, and then there's a region here, say that's exon two, and then this part here is exon three. And ultimately, if it's a messenger RNA molecule, those are the RNAs that encode proteins, this 
gets a poly A tail added to it at the three prime end of the RNA and then there's a five prime cap over here. But this is a mature RNA molecule and it turns out that not the entire RNA encodes the protein but some region with within the RNA molecule, let, I'll just draw something here like this, this part might encode the protein so this part here is not involved or does not encode the protein molecule and this part over here doesn't involve encoding the molecule. This is called the three prime untranslated region and this is called the five prime untranslated region and it's just a region in the middle that ultimately encodes the protein. It's called the coding sequence of the RNA molecule. I'm not going to go through the details of that but if you know that you have a mature RNA molecule. You can use programs to figure out what the coding sequence is and deduce the amino acid sequence from that segment of the RNA molecule. That is to say, if you know the nucleotide sequence of the mature RNA molecule, you can use computer programs to determine what the coding sequence is, that is the part of the RNA molecule that ultimately encodes the amino acid sequence of the protein. Just to summarize, in humans there are 46 strands of DNA, double helical DNA molecules, and 1 to 2 percent of the information on the DNA is converted into RNA molecules in the process of generating RNA from DNA is called transcription. And the process of converting messenger RNA, that is a sub-segment of the RNA, are messenger RNA molecules, as opposed to ribosomal RNA, for instance. And those give rise to amino acid sequences, which are proteins. And the process of going from RNA molecule to an amino acid sequence or a protein is called translation. And again, if we have a mature messenger RNA molecule that has a series of A's at the end, the poly A tail, this is the five prime end of the molecule and the three prime end of the molecule, there is a region internal to the five prime and three prime ends, which is called the coding sequence. And that is the part of the molecule that ultimately is read three at a time. As we know, there are three nucleotides that give rise to one amino acid, like ATG. Those three nucleotides encode the amino acid methionine as an example. So Osama Shimamura purified two proteins biochemically, one called aquarin and the other called green fluorescent protein, GFP. After Shimamura discovered these two proteins, they were able to come up with part of their amino acid sequence. And then Marty Chalfie at Columbia University was able to figure out what messenger RNA encoded this green fluorescent protein. So they figured out what RNA molecule encodes GFP, they figured out the sequence that gives rise to the amino acids of green fluorescent protein and they were able to figure out what the coding sequence of that RNA molecule is. That is what part of the RNA molecule encodes green fluorescent protein. Once Chalfie and his colleagues deduced the coding sequence that gives rise to green fluorescent protein, they could use PCR to amplify 
just this region, just the coding sequence, the part of the molecule that encodes the amino acids of GFP, make millions or billions of copies of this double strand sequence, and then insert the coding sequence into the genomes of a prokaryotic organism, namely E. coli bacteria, and a eukaryotic organism, C. elegans, which is a small worm. Now, the bacteria and the worm have the coding sequence of GFP inserted into their genomes, and they express RNA and ultimately GFP protein. And if you shine blue light on these two organisms, the green fluorescent protein gave off green light and the organisms fluoresced green. This experiment demonstrated that if you put the coding sequence of green fluorescent protein into both a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic organism, that these organisms can express the gene, and that other than shining blue light on the organism, no other cofactor was required for the green fluorescence to appear. Finally, a third scientist, Roger Chen, was able to take the RNA molecule with the poly A tail and mutate the coding sequence, and in doing so, created a rainbow of different fluorescent proteins. So instead of just green fluorescent protein, he developed blue fluorescent protein, which is B. FP for blue fluorescent protein, RFP for red fluorescent protein, and so on. Ultimately, Osama Shimamira, Marty Chalfie, and Roger Chen shared the Nobel Prize for their efforts. But why would you win the Nobel Prize for figuring out what makes a jellyfish glow green? Or by discovering that if you insert the gene for GFP into an organism, that it will fluoresce green under the influence of blue light? Or for mutating GFP to create this rainbow of colors. The reason is that these three individuals together revolutionized light microscopy by creating a set of molecules that could be used to tag proteins of interest and study their distribution within cells. One way of tagging a protein of interest with green fluorescent protein would be to take its RNA molecule let's say kinesin, which is my favorite protein, which is a motor protein, and it's a homodimer, so there's one copy of the kinesin, and then a second copy held together by a coiled coil, and kinesin moves along microtubules, which are part of the cytoskeleton of the cell, and these two structures, which are called heads, actually operate like feet and they walk along the microtubule and hydrolyze ATP, which is a universal fuel in biology. So if we have the kinesin RNA molecule, we could figure out its coding sequence. It's in here somewhere. And then you have the coding sequence for green fluorescent protein, GFP. you could use molecular biology techniques to combine the two coding sequences. So you could have this part of the kinesin, which is the five prime untranslated region, and then you could have the coding sequence for kinesin, like this here. This is the coding sequence from here. And then you could have the coding sequence, so this is kinesin, and then you could have the coding sequence for GFP, and then you could have the three prime untranslated region of kinesin. And if you inserted this, if you injected this into a cell, for instance, uh, this could be translated into a protein. And now you would have a kinesin with a GFP 
which of course is also a protein. GFP is a protein, green fluorescent protein. So you have kinesin protein attached to GFP. And now if you shine blue light on this chimeric molecule, this hybrid, then it will glow green. So you'll be able to see where kinesin is in the cell based on the presence of green fluorescent protein attached to its tail. Another way of targeting protein is with the use of antibodies. Antibodies are part of our immune system and they're generated anytime a foreign substance enters our body. Our body recognizes that substance as foreign and it builds a very specific antibody that will bind to that foreign substance and target it for degradation. So the antibodies are shaped like a Y, like this. And most of the antibody is the same. It's called the conserved domain. This whole region here is the conserved domain. And that's conserved, that is, each antibody has that identical part. But the antibodies also have a variable domain, which are at the tips of the Y here, that are specifically designed to bind to whatever foreign substance has entered our body. So if we have something like influenza, for instance, that enters our body, we build an antibody specific to that substance. And once the antibodies bind to influenza, in this case, it targets it for degradation. When we're immunized, we receive an injection of a non-virulent form of the foreign substance, like influenza. So it's either mutated or it's heat inactivated. It's destroyed in some way so that it won't give us the illness, but it generates the immune response and generates antibodies against this non-virulent form of influenza. In this way, our body builds antibodies, which remain in our system and can quickly bind to, to native influenza, I mean real influenza virus. And once we've made the antibody, our body remembers how to make more so that if we're infected with real influenza, we'll have a faster immune response to targeting influenza and destroying it. The reason why we need to get an injection every year is because the influenza mutates and the antibodies that we generated in the past flu season might not recognize the influenza in the next season. So scientists have taken advantage of the immune response to generate antibodies that can be used for research. Many organisms possess this type of immune response like rabbits, for instance, or mice, chickens, and so on. And if we wanted to make an antibody against kinesin, we could purify kinesin from some brain tissue Maybe we want to study kinesin from squid, so we would biochemically purify squid kinesin and then inject it into the rabbit. The rabbit recognizes squid kinesin as foreign, and it builds antibodies against squid kinesin. Then you can draw some of the blood from the rabbit, and you can, and you can spin it down in a test tube, and all of the red blood cells and lymphocytes go into the pellet, and the serum is enriched with the antibodies, like this. So now you can pipette this off, and you can use these antibodies now to tag and study kinesin. So now if you wanted to study the distribution of kinesin in the squid brain, you could dissect out a portion of the brain, like the optic lobe, which is responsible for vision. It's about the size of a pea, and you could section it with a machine designed to do that, to create very thin sections, and now you could have a microscope slide, and you could have a section of brain tissue on it like this, and you could then add some antibody in liquid in a buffer, and the antibody would find kinesin and bind to it. Now, you could do one of two things. Prior to this step, you could conjugate GFP directly to the antibody. So you have GFP attached to the antibody. Alternatively, companies take antibodies from rabbit, for instance, and they inject them into a different organism, like donkey. So now you have rabbit antibodies injected into a donkey 
and the donkey makes antibodies that bind to rabbit antibodies and target it for degradation. I mean, it recognizes, the donkey's body recognizes the rabbit antibodies as being foreign, and so it builds antibodies against rabbit antibodies. Then you can draw those donkey anti-rabbit antibodies from the donkey. Now we have these antibodies, whoops, from, now we have an antibody from donkey, and you can conjugate green fluorescent protein to the donkey anti-rabbit, and then after you incubate the kinesin, the rabbit kinesin antibody with the optic lobe section, you can then um, add the donkey anti-rabbit antibody, which will bind to the rabbit antibody, and that's conjugated to green fluorescent protein, for instance. Then you could tag the brain tissue with two different antibodies at the same time. I mean, so this one could be tagged green fluorescent protein, and then you could develop another antibody that has to be in a different host, like mouse. So now you have a mouse antibody, and you have another secondary antibody that's, say, donkey anti-mouse, and you conjugate, the company conjugates this antibody against red fluorescent protein. So now this antibody could, say, be, be against tubulin, which is the road that kinesin runs on, and this one is against kinesin. And the antibodies against the tubulin would bind to the tubulin and label it with RFP, and then label the kinesins with GFP, and you could observe the two different colors of fluorescence, green and red, in a fluorescent microscope. So just to clarify, the antibody that was raised against kinesin in rabbit is called the primary antibody. It's the first antibody. So that is a rabbit anti-kinesin antibody. The antibody raised against tubulin, we said, would be raised in a different host organism like mouse. I'll get to that in a moment. So that is a mouse anti-tubulin or microtubule antibody raised in mouse. The two antibodies that we said could be raised in donkey, I mean two different donkeys, one that was raised against rabbit antibodies and one that was raised against mouse antibodies, those two are called the secondary antibody because they're the second, they're the secondary antibody that binds to the primary, binds to the first. Those are conjugated to do different fluorophores. The donkey anti-rabbit was conjugated to green fluorescent protein, and the donkey anti-mouse was conjugated to red fluorescent protein. The reason why the two primaries can't be raised in the same host is because if you had a rabbit anti-kinesin and a rabbit anti-tubulin, when you add the secondary antibody, green fluorescent protein conjugated to donkey anti-rabbit, then that antibody would recognize both types of primary antibodies and would turn both the antibodies attached to tubulin and those attached to kinesin green. And you don't want that. You want the two different targets to fluoresce in two different colors so you can dis discern each of those two and their distribution relative to one another.